All right, tonight I want to share with you a message, or as I uh, just said a few moments ago, a Bible study, if you will, uh, that I've titled, God Has Invested in You. God's Invested in You. And the text for our message uh, tonight comes from the parable of what we call the gold bags, which is taught by Jesus in Matthew chapter 25. But many of us may know this parable as the parable of the talents. That's the way it's described in the 1984 version of the NIV. But uh, in recent times, we've switched over uh, to the uh, 2011 version of the NIV. For the most part, it's very, very similar, but there are some differences. Uh, So tonight, uh, when we talk about the talent of the gold bags, it's also known by many as the the, uh, parable of the talents. So before reading our text, uh, I do want to take a moment and provide a little bit of background information uh, around our text tonight. Tonight we find Jesus uh, teaching this parable to his disciples as they were positioned on the Mount of Olives. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to uh, Israel or not. I have not been there, uh, but I have a good little Bible map on my uh, computer that I like to pull up and, and look at. But the Mount of Olives is located just outside Uh, Jerusalem, on the east side of Jerusalem. And uh, we see that Jesus is actually teaching uh, this parable uh, of the gold bags on Tuesday of Passion Week. So this is Tuesday. This is actually two days before Friday, which would be the day when Jesus would go and die on the cross to pay the price for our sins. And of course, we know that three days later on that Sunday morning, that Jesus rose up out of that grave to defeat uh, our in, the enemy of, Sa- our, well, of Satan, but also of death. And it was then that Jesus brought us the great victory that we continue to celebrate to this day. So here we are on Tuesday of the Passion Week, and Jesus is on Mount Olives uh, with his disciples, and he's teaching them about a variety of subjects. And uh, one particular subject that he takes some time to talk about is the, is the current and the future state of the kingdom of God. Uh, this is also known, um, uh, part of Matthew chapter 24 and 25 uh, encompasses what we know as the Olivet Discourse. And he addresses a variety of subjects and questions, but the one that we're going to focus in on tonight is the current and the future state of the kingdom of God. So with this in mind, if you would, please follow along as I read tonight's text. It comes from Matthew chapter 25, uh, beginning with verse 14, and I believe we have it on the overhead. Verse 14, Jesus says that again... It will be light. Now, let me stop just for one moment and remind us that the it here refers to the kingdom of God. So again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and he put his money to work and he gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off. He dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came and said, master, You entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And then the man who had received one bag 
of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you did, where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags for whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. And whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where, the, where there will be weeping and gnashing of, che- of teeth. In this parable, uh, we see clearly that God expects us to be faithful, hardworking servants in his kingdom. Amen? When he saves us, and he invites us into his kingdom, and we become part of his family, we also then become part of his plans and purposes that he has on this earth. We're not just called to just sit here and just kind of look up at the sky every day, just kind of sing Kumbaya, Lord, and just kind of wonder when he's going to come back, but rather we're to be seeking uh, God's will and his plans for uh, his earthly kingdom that he has down here on this earth so that we might understand our part and our role and all that God's trying to do in our lives and in our community and in our church. God expects us to be faithful, expects us to be hardworking servants. How many know that God is heavily invested in the lives of his people? Amen. God is personally invested into each one of his children. Think about it with me for just a moment. We know that God the Father is invested in us because he sent his one and his only son to come to this earth. And from heaven, God the Father watched his son go to the cross and die on that cruel cross and suffer great pain. Can you imagine how hard and difficult that was on God the Father? But yet he did it. And why did he do it? He did it because he loves you and I. And God himself, God the Father, is invested in us. Of course, we know that Jesus, the Son, God the Son, is greatly invested in us as well. He himself was willing to leave heaven, to come down here, to, uh, take on the, the, to take up a body, a human body, and to walk where we walk, and to look into our lives and, and connect with us and, and reveal to us what the heavenly Father is like, and to ultimately pay the greatest price of all by being willing to lay down his life for us. Jesus did this because he wanted to invest and offer to us the wonderful gift of salvation. How many tonight are glad that you've got the gift of salvation? Amen. And we know that the Holy Spirit, he himself, as Pastor Lowell reminded us of this past Sunday, the Holy Spirit is not an it, but rather the Holy Spirit. He is God uh, with, he is also God and that the Holy Spirit has come to indwell and to invest his power in us so that we might live victorious lives. How many know that this world in which we live in, uh, it's coming after us. It's a tough place to live and to overcome, isn't it? Especially uh, I'm learning as we all are seeing the year 2020. Uh, I've been looking at a lot of posts on Facebook lately that just talks about kind of they're making different jokes about how uh, tough 2020 is and what a crazy year it's been with the, the virus and uh, uh, with all the other things that are going on. Uh, in this world. I I saw one of my cousins today, uh, Renee, she lives in Eldon. She posted on Facebook and something along the lines that said, Hey mom, uh, is that offer to slap me in the next year still good? (laughs) Cause she said, I'm ready, (laughs) ready to get out of 2020. But we know that the Holy spirit, he indwells in us to make us victorious. And how many know that no matter what comes up against us in 2020, or 2021, or 2022, or 2023, as long as the Holy Spirit is living on the inside, we're going to be overcomers. Amen? God is heavily invested 
in his people. And this parable also reminds us to be careful not to waste the God-given opportunities to reinvest these blessings and those gifts in order to grow the kingdom of God. And as we'll see from this parable, that when we reinvest what God has invested into our lives, into the lives of others, that Jesus goes on in this parable to reveal to us, and I love this part, that one day when we stand before God, that God is going to reward us for our great work and that reinvestment that we put into uh, God's kingdom and his plans here on this earth and that reinvestment that we make into the lives of others. He's going to pay us for all of that investing and all of that sacrificial giving and spending that we do in the lives of others. So Christian friends, that means that one day we'll get our payday. Someday we'll get our payday. And how many know it's not too far away, is it? But this will only happen, friends, if we're faithful to serve God. And to serve others. If we don't reinvest the blessings, the gifts, the opportunity that God has entrusted with us, then it will be a day of great shame and sorrow when we have to stand before Jesus. And I don't know about you, but when I stand before him one day and I'm starting to get a little bit ahead of myself here, but one day I want to make sure when I stand before him that I've got something to lay down at his feet. How about you tonight? I want something to lay at his feet. How many know that he deserves that? Amen. He's worth it. So Jesus warns us, take the investments that God has made in our lives and go out and reinvest them in his kingdom and in others so that when Jesus returns, we'll be ready to meet him and he'll be ready to pay us. Not because we deserve it, not because he owes it to us, but because he is good and gracious and generous. And he makes it clear that when he returns one day, that he is going to reward those that have been faithful. And I want the rewards of God. Amen. So with this in mind, let's quickly look at this parable. Tonight, I want to break this parable up into five different sections. These sections are connected to specific moments in the lives of the three servants found in this parable. The first section I've titled is the day of receiving. The day of receiving. In verse 14, Jesus said, and again, it will be like a man who's going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them with the wealth, with his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, to another one, one bag, each according to his ability, and then he went on his journey. So here Jesus says that the kingdom of God is, he likens it unto a man, a master that goes off on a journey, but before he leaves, he calls his servants and he gives them each a portion of his wealth. So the master entrusts his wealth with his servants so that while he is gone, that they can take his property, they can take his businesses, they can take his current wealth, and they can go out and they can reinvest it so that his estate will grow in his absence. He wants the estate to grow bigger. How many know that this is God's desire that his kingdom continues to grow. Amen? How many know that John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. It doesn't say that he just loved a certain people group. He didn't say that he just loved Israel or some other nation or tribe. But it says that God so loved the world. How many know that God doesn't just want the 99 if he can get the 100, amen? How many know that God has flung the door wide open for the lost to come in? 
The, the door, the season of grace that we're living in in these last times, the door to salvation is wide open for the world to walk into. God graciously leaves it open. He wants his kingdom to grow. So when God invests in us, he's doing so so that he might receive a return on the investment that he's already put in us. Did you follow that? When God invests in us, He's doing so so that he might receive a return on his investment in us. God wants us to identify those around us that currently aren't in the kingdom of God. He wants us to identify those that are lost right now. He wants us to then go after them, to connect with them, to reach out to them, to invite them to his kingdom, to invite him to the table of God. How many know that the table of God, it's big and it's long, it's vast. And how many know that everyone is welcome if you're willing to come up and sit at his table? And God wants us to go out and reinvest what he's invested in us so that when he comes back one day, he, he'll be expecting us to have something to lay at his feet. We see in verse 15 that not everyone received the same investment. Some were given five bags of gold. Others were given two bags and even one was just given one bag. The Bible says that each servant was given money according to his ability. How many know by now you've lived long enough and you've been around long enough to know that not everybody has the same abilities, do they? We, we all are different, and that's okay. That, that's quite all right. Uh, some of us have more abilities than others, but the bottom line is God knows what we're capable of, and God gives us responsibilities and has expectations that match our abilities. And what we're going to see shortly is that it's not your level of abilities that matters to God, but rather what matters to God is the level that you put your abilities to work. Did you get that? That is, whatever it is that God has given you, God wants to see what measure, what level of it are you reinvesting, are you putting to work. Another way that we might say it is we need to avoid being underachievers. If there's anything that I want to avoid in life, or let me restart that statement. If there's anything that I want to avoid in the kingdom of God, since I'm a part of the kingdom of God, is I don't want the label over my life as an, underachiev an underachiever. I don't want that. And you don't have to be perfect to be successful in God's kingdom. But if we're not careful, friends, listen, we can be underachieving Christians, and we can fall short of the personal goals that God has for our lives. An underachieving Christian is one that I would describe maybe as a, an excuse maker. That is when God maybe calls them to do something, or God calls you to, to do something. And when you begin to look at it, you begin to look at it in ways that you think, well, I don't think this is going to work for me, God. I don't think this is going to work. I can't do that. And we begin to make excuses when God calls us to do something. Well, if we're going to be an excuse maker, then how many knows we're probably going to be an underachiever? An underachieving Christian might be one who's afraid to get out of the boat. One who's afraid to get out of the comfort zone. One that maybe loves tradition. One that says, hey, this is the way I've always done it. So God, if you want to accomplish some other things in my life, can we just stick with tradition? Can we stick with the way I know how to do things? How many know that God normally, he doesn't even pay attention to that prayer, does he? Or that request, does he? He just kind of, he just kind of goes right on by him. But friends, these are some mistakes that we can make and end up being an underachieving Christian. And we're going to see shortly that God was pleased with the servant that received five bags of gold and the servant that received two bags of gold because get this, he was pleased with them because you know what? 
they invested all that God gave them. Hmm? He in, they invested everything that God gave them. I love that. They recognized how good and gracious God had been. They recognize what a beautiful privilege and honor it is to be able to uh, not a, just let alone being recognized by God, but being called up upon God to be part of his business and his kingdom and to understand his will. They recognize that God, whatever you give me, it's worth pouring right back into your kingdom and your purposes. And God was pleased with them because they invested all their ability into God's purposes and plans for their life. But the main point right now that I want us to focus on is that God had entrusted, that God has entrusted you with resources and responsibilities and opportunities in his kingdom so that you can do your part in growing God's kingdom. That's another main point from this parable tonight. Kind of connects with the last time that I preached where we talked about how God's desire is to produce more and more fruit in our life. So that we might bring more glory to the Father. But tonight we're talking about producing more and more works and investment so that we might grow God's kingdom, get more people to come in. What better thing, how do they say that? Uh, the only thing that's better than going to heaven is taking someone with you, amen? So after entrusting his property to his servants, we see at the end of verse 15 that the master leaves and he goes away on a journey. With the master now gone, this brings us into a season of time and opportunity for the servants now to begin to reinvest their master's money. The master's gone. He's left everything in their care and their attention. And he's gone for a season of time. So this is what I call the, the days of reinvesting. This is the current season, friends, that we're living in, in the church age. Jesus has gone away 2,000 years ago for a season of time. And now we're here in the days of reinvesting. In verse 16, it said that the man who had received five bags of gold went at once and he put his money to work and gained five more bags so also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. So the servant that received five bags of gold and the servant that received two bags of gold, it says that they went out at once and they began to put their master's money to work. In other words, they didn't waste any time. They went right out and went right to work. Friends, they had an urgency to get out and to get to work. And I thought, friends, how uh, having received so many blessings from God, how God has blessed us so much, shouldn't we wake up every day with an urge inside <coughs> to get out and to go out and to reinvest what God has deposited in us? Amen? For some, he may have deposited maybe just a few extra dollars in your bank account. And you feel like, well, I don't really have a lot to give when it comes to finances. I see a lot of people around me who have financial problems. Well, one thing I, I learned in life is you really don't even have to have a lot of money to still be a blessing financially to people. Sometimes you can just give a 5 or $10 bill to someone, and it might make uh, the world a difference in their day. Amen? It could definitely change their day. If you don't believe that. I challenge you to practice that this Sunday and come up to me and say, Pastor Bob, here's five dollars, here's ten bucks, and you watch the biggest smile come up on my face. Sometimes, sometimes my boss is sitting over here. So, Pastor Lowe, if I just get my check at the end of the month, that brings a smile to my face. But sometimes I think we fall into the trap. I do, I know personally. Sometimes I pass, I believe, on so many opportunities to bless someone, to help someone, uh, because I feel like it's not that big of a thing. For some, he's given you the time and the talent to be able to go and help others in the church. And I want to go out on a limb a little bit here tonight and share an example of this 
from our church family that just happened this afternoon. I'm talking about God giving some of us time, more time and talent to be able to go out and help others around us. <clears throat> I've been talking, I'm not, I'm not going to share the names with you tonight. They know who they are if they're listening tonight or if they hear this message in the future. But we had an older gentleman in our, in our church who's been building a small little shed in his backyard. He's up in age. I'm not going to say his age because I don't want to offend anyone. I don't know who, what your all's ages are tonight. But he's been struggling with this shed. He thought he can handle it himself. But it's created him a lot of pain and aches in his body. And he, God just been kind of laying him on my heart lately. And I was just trying to figure out how I might be able to get out and, and help him. And I remembered that there was another gentleman in our church last year that told me, I said, hey, Bob, I'm retired now. If there's anybody ever in church that needs any kind of little construction help or anything, let me know. I want to come and help them. <laughs> so last week I <clears throat> reached out to this person in our church that said he was willing to help. And I said, hey, is that offer still good? There's a gentleman over here that I, that I think God's laid on my heart and maybe you can help him out. He said, yeah, you bet. So anyway, I, I shared the number with this gentleman to have him give him a call. And I'd been wondering actually the last day or two if anything ever became of that. It was Wednesday and I thought, well, I thought I would have heard something by now. And I, I'm preaching tonight, but I might check in tomorrow and see what's going on. Well, I got a call uh, this afternoon and say, hey, uh, I've been trying to reach out to this guy, tell him I can help him, but his number's not working. His phone's not working. So I said, hmm, that's strange. So anyway, I pick up the phone and I call him and I get a hold of him on a cell phone. His home phone wasn't working. And when I told him what we had for him, he was just blown away. He just said, he said, God still answers prayer. He said, I want you to know that. And anyway, this other gentleman, so I said, well, hey, why don't you give him a call? So he called him and he got lined up with him. He sent this email to me, I guess it's 631 tonight. No, well, that was a little bit earlier this afternoon. And I just want to read a portion of it, the one that received the help from an, another person in our church. He said, so back to the shed, the shed he's been building. I worked really hard for four days. He said, no breakfast or lunch. I worked until 8 p.m. or later. Last night, every cut, every scrape, my knees, my elbow, my shoulder, my brain kept me from sleeping for more than 30 to 45 minutes at a time. No pill I took helped. I prayed every waking moment and even during my sleep dreams for God to give me rest and help me. I finally got to sleep and then a robocaller called and I hung up and unplugged the house phone. How many know there's not going to be robocallers in heaven? Somebody say amen. He said, I text messaged, I text messaged a friend and went back to bed around 2.30. Or and went back to bed. He said around 2.30, Pastor Bob called and said he had a church person who would be willing to help people who need some work done. And he said, concluded it this way. He said, this was not by coincidence. God truly answers prayers. Friends, that's working in the kingdom of God. That's being a faithful servant. Sometimes when we reinvest what God has invested in us, it's not just reinvesting it into the world that's outside the kingdom of God, but sometimes God turns us right to somebody else that's in his kingdom and says, now you invest and you pour into them. I've given you the time. I've given you the talent and the ability to reach out and to help that person and so here we are, an awesome example of someone in our church that has been a faithful servant in the kingdom of God. And I could go on with so many others um, in our church, and I couldn't name them all tonight, but just real quick for others, he's uh, uh, deposited within them the ability to swing a hammer and do construction stuff. Um, if that's you, maybe God might want to send you on some uh, future construction missions trip that we do through our church. I think of uh, Sam Binkley and Ben Sudoff who have been used to do that over the last couple of years. I think about others that he's deposited the gift of singing and music in. 
I, I think of others who he's given the ability to, to cook and to be a great cook. I, I think of Michael Ferguson that feeds the homeless, at, uh, who goes to our church, but feeds the homeless at First Baptist on a, a regular basis. Last week, I had the privilege to go out and visit Jennifer Chapman at her house with Pastor Lowell and some others, and I was reminded and got to ask her about the time that she, she's a nurse and she got to go on medical missions trips. Why? So that she might reinvest what God has invested in her. That's what Jesus is instructing his disciples to do two days before he goes to the cross is to get out there and to reinvest into God's plans and God's people. Amen. So next we see that not every servant, though, that the master gave money to went out and went to work. And that brings us from the the days of of reinvesting to others who are going currently now through the days of resting. That is, they're not doing anything for the kingdom of God. Look at verse 18. It says, but the man who had received one bag went off. He dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Then after a long time, the master of those servants returned. So this man, instead of going off and getting right to work, He chose rather to go and to bury his master's money and do nothing with it. He chose to go and do other things in life. He found greater importance and priority into other things in this world. Sadly, there are a lot of people, even around around us, who claim to be Christian. But really, when you really get to know them and you look at them, you, it appears that they really aren't doing much for the kingdom of God. They have virtually taken what God has given them and buried it. You might be thinking, how can you say that? Well, I've ran into many people over the years that they claim to be Christian. And you ask them, such questions such as, well, what church do you go to? Or what's your pastor's name? And they can't even many times tell you who the current pastor is at that church. And sometimes I found out they don't even know the name of their own church. They just know it's some other, some other church in that direction on a hill by Dick's Road or someplace out that way. And when they tell me that, I can't help but think, man, I don't think you're doing much for the kingdom of God when you can't even tell me the name of your church or the name of your pastor. Think what they've done is rather they've buried the gift of the local church. God gave us the gift of the local church and many people bury it. Pardon me for preaching maybe a little hard tonight for a few moments. I've got a lot of friends and family members that are like this. I don't know if I want them to be watching tonight or not at this point, but we're going to throw it out there. They want to talk, I've learned, to me about church. They want to talk to me a lot of times about God. They want to talk about the Bible and end-time prophecy. They want to talk about being water baptized. But you know what? They won't even get up on Sunday morning and go to church. Friends, listen. I figure if we're going to get out and work for God... We've got to start by getting out of bed on Sunday mornings and getting to the house of God. Amen. I better move on before I get in trouble here. Others aren't working for God because they're caught up in the things of the world. The options are endless in the world around us. They fill their schedule with everything that they possibly want to do in their life. And then they just try to squeeze in a little bit of God into their schedule every once in a while. How many know that our God is not little? He doesn't squeeze in the little places, amen? He's a big God, and he deserves the first item, the first line on our schedule. And some believers, they're workaholics. They don't really have time to get too involved with the things of God. Some aren't working because they're too scared to take a chance on what God's calling them to do. We see at the end of this parable that the servant that went out and buried their investment, buried it, dug a hole and buried it because he was scared. The servant was scared. Sometimes we're scared to make a mistake. 
Sometimes we're scared to let God descend us into the unknown. So friends, the list of excuses can go on and on and on. And it can ultimately keep us from ever accomplishing anything for the kingdom of God. And friends, tonight, this parable, Jesus reminds us that that would be a great tragedy. He warns us, be careful that we don't bury and waste the opportunities to reinvest in God's kingdom, to reinvest what God's doing. How many know that even though Jesus has been gone physically from this earth the last 2,000 years, how many know he's been doing a lot? Amen? He's accomplished a lot. And I remind us tonight, friends, that life is short. Life is short. And that means this, that it really doesn't take long than to waste our lives, does it? It doesn't take long to waste our lives. We've got to be careful. I got to move a little bit quicker tonight. So that takes us from the day of rest of this lazy, wicked servant to the day of returns. Quickly, two categories of returns that I want to mention. I want to talk about the return of the master, and then I want to talk about the investment returns that are going to be owed to the Lord when he returns, and the investment returns that the Lord will pay to his servants. Verse 19 says, After a long time, the master of those servants returned, and he settled accounts with them. Friends, I just want to remind us real quickly here tonight that God is keeping good track of our lives. Sometimes I know that as we're uh, serving God and serving his people, that sometimes we might feel like nobody's even noticing. And sometimes we wonder even if God is noticing. But I want to remind us tonight that God is keeping good track of our labor before him. And not one thing that we do or say for his sake and his purposes and plans, uh, he will forget And he's going to come back one day and he's going to settle accounts with us. And when he returns, friends, he's going to settle accounts with us. And we're going to, he's going to examine what what we did with his investment in our lives. And then he's going to collect his returns from us. And then secondly, he's going to reward us and pay us uh, for our work. I'm starting to wrap up here real quick. Let me read verses 20 through 23 real quick. It says, the man who had received the five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've got five more. And his master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And he says the same thing to the, the, man, the servant that had two bags. And friends, I want to encourage you tonight again that there will be a payday someday for the faithful servant of God. Would you say amen? Amen. And the two men who put their money to work, uh, they each received the same approval. And real quick, before we move on to the next section, I want to remind us that it was not the portion that they received that made the difference, but it was the proportion. That is, what do you do with what God has given you? Don't get hung up in thinking that you haven't done any more than someone else around you. Get hung up on, God, have I done what I should have done with what you've given me? God, have I pleased you? Not have I beat somebody else and outdone somebody else in the body of Christ, but have I I done enough to please you? That should be our goal. That should be our focus. Amen. Then finally, finally, we come to the day of regrets. This parable closes out on a downer. Verse 24 says, then the man who had received one bag of gold came and said, master, I knew that you are a hard man harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. The master said, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. 
For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Friends, for some, the end is not going to be a day of rewards and a day of returns on investments. But for some, it's going to be a day of regret, a great day of sorrow and sadness when the master, when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. So tonight, this message is not to scare us or or make us feel down, but it is to warn us, to be reminded that we need to be about the Father's business on an ongoing basis. We need to be locked in like never before on the plans and the purposes that God has for his kingdom in our lives, in our home, and in our church, and in our city. Amen? Because the time is short. The master is not far from coming back. And I know that you're like me. I want to be ready. I want to take what God has invested in me and I want to reinvest it in the world around me. Not so that I'll just get reward, but so that I might please him and bring more glory to God. Amen. Amen. Would you?